Christ. Amen. There is a high calling, Brother Bobby. Amen. It is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ certainly has made us, as it were, free from the bondage of sin and death. And we certainly thank God for that tonight. Amen. We bless him because he is, amen, certainly magnificent and he is worthy uh, to be glorified and worthy to be praised tonight. And I'm certainly a recipient of the bountiful riches that come from being a child of God and knowing who Jesus is. Can the church say amen? Um, without him, we would certainly won't be, wouldn't be able to make it. We certainly would but fail. But because of what Jesus does for us, amen, and the motivation that he puts into our lives, it's a wonderful privilege to know him and to thank him um, for everything that he does. One writer said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. Amen. Don't nobody look better than Jesus. <laughs> you won't find anybody better than him. Amen. And you know what, saints? I found out that the search was over. I'm not looking for anything else, Sister Hayes. I got everything I need in Jesus Christ. Uh, salvation, saints, is certainly precious, and that which God does for us is certainly um, worth noting. Um, and we certainly should be thankful for everything that he does. So I want to thank God for our uh, consecration and um, that which God, I believe, is going to do through this time um, when we uh, dedicate and rededicate ourselves to the service of God. I think consecration is important because it allows um, people to focus in, amen, on the things that matter in life. So many times life, um, in many cases, saints, uh, can this get us so sped up? Amen. I've been in the workforce and still am, still am in the workforce. I'm just working in a different capacity. But being out in the hustle and bustle of life, it just gets you so sped up. So many things to do. So many places to go. But consecration sometimes settles us down and gets our mind focused in on him. I like the way Paul said in one place in the book of Colossians, I think it's around chapters number three. <laughs> In verses number two where he said, set your affections on things above and not on things of this world. Amen. Because the things that are of heavenly value is what's going to matter in the end. Can the church say amen? amen. And as I made the point in, in previous Bible studies that um, in as much as whatever we enjoy in this life is only for a season. Whether it be good or whether it be bad, we can only have it for a certain space of time. And so I would rather spend my time um, doing the things in life that will value, that will give me eternal value, and that will allow me to receive uh, the goodness of God in my life so that I can, of course, see him as somebody say he is. For the Bible said, any man having this hope purifieth himself, as somebody say he is pure. After he told us when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And sorry to say, saints, there are a lot of people who don't care about looking like Jesus. Praise the Lord. And they won't have to worry about it because they won't see him. Can the church say amen? And so, but as for me in my house, I will serve who? Somebody say the Lord. And so I want to be saved. Can the church say amen? So consecration is a wonderful thing. The first week of consecration certainly We've been talking about preparing the heart. The Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this consecration will have a focus on the heart condition of man. Because the heart, saints, is simply where everything um, in terms of our life comes from. It is where we gather our resolve to do what we do. It comes from the inner man, the heart, or the mind. Can the church say amen? And so we're now we're preparing our mind by getting our vessel in a place where God can speak to us. Sometimes what God does, saints, is that he, um, he's, he puts us in a place where he can simply deep compress us. Praise God, because this world has a, um, the system of this world has a way of putting pressure on us because we have so many obligations to meet on a daily basis. But sometimes I like, to, I like to think of it from this standpoint. In years gone by, when life was much simpler, there was a lot less pressure. And people were able to uh, think their 
way through things, praise God, before they reacted in certain ways. Can the church say amen? And so through consecration, it's going to help us, uh, Sister Pam, to decompress and then allow God to speak to us. Because I found out in my walk with God that God will sometimes isolate you simply so he can get your attention. And God does this. He, he takes us out of or takes away certain circumstances, certain things um, that we felt like we had to live with. Can the church say amen? And so well, let me give you, I'm going to give you an ex, a prime example of that. Facebook. Praise the Lord. Facebook is something that some people think they have to live with. But I guarantee you these last few days people found out that maybe I can survive without it for a little while. Can the church say amen? Maybe the world is not going to crumble. I remember I had a young man a uh, 20 something uh, year old young man that um, he had, a, I think he had an iPhone or something along those lines, and he lost his phone. He couldn't find his phone. He, no, he left it at home. And it was almost as though he, was, he had a nervous breakdown. Praise the Lord, because he couldn't find his, because he didn't have his phone on him. He said, I need my phone. I feel like I'm naked or something. I said, Well, you know, you're going to survive. I didn't say that to him, but in my mind, well, you're, you're not going to die because you don't have your phone. Praise the Lord. Uh, it'll be there when you get home, praise the Lord. So that's the point I'm trying to get to. Sometimes people think they need things that they really don't. Can the church say amen? And so what we need is somebody say J-E-S-U-S. Can the church say amen? His name is Jesus. That's what I need. I don't need everything else. Some things I can get by without. I don't need steak when I can eat a pork chop. I'll just, I'll just make it. Not this week, exactly. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. I could eat some green beans or whatever. Whatever you like, praise the Lord. So this is the point. So consecration simply focuses our mind on somebody say Jesus Christ because he is the one that sustains us. Can the church say amen? And his word, one writer said that I, that I esteem the word of God more than my necessary food, as it were. Can the church say amen? And I'm paraphrasing that. But this is certainly a wonderful thing. Praise the Lord. So I hope all is well, and I believe God is going to give us a great jubilee during our consecration. The chains will fall off. The burdens will be lifted. Can the church say amen? Um, all of these things is going to happen as we consecrate and give ourselves to the Lord. I can remember going through consecrations where on Rena Street, uh, we had a consecration one time where we were, the theme was um, dealing with the walls coming down. And um, it was, um, saints, a wonderful time. And I can remember um, we were at Rena Street and we went around the sanctuary. And then it was almost as though we shouted for joy. And I can remember in the spirit, and I'm just telling my experience as I went through it. My experience is almost as though I was climbing the walls of Jericho. And it wasn't something I was making up. I was, I was in the spirit. My eyes were closed. And it was almost, Sister Sandy, as, as though I was actually climbing the walls. The walls were coming down. And things that the enemy was, was trying to bother me with, they went away. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They were gone. Why? Because I participated and God came through and did something for me. And this is what this time of consecration does. It helps us to get something for us. Can the church say amen? Somebody say it's about you. This is, one, this is one time you can be selfish. And you can say, I'm going to get what I need from God. And nobody has to know about it. Can the church say amen? And I tell people all the time, you don't have to tell everybody about your business. The, script, the, the songwriter said, turn it over to Jesus. And you can what? Smile the rest of your days. Now, if you got to deal with something, you know, we, we know how to get that straight. But the point I'm saying, when we're coming to God and consecrating, we're coming to the Lord to get our help. Can the church say amen? Because he is, amen, our helper. Praise the Lord. And so we're going to get back into our Bible class that we have been teaching um, for the last few Bible studies on the five works of the sonship. And we're dealing with the second work of the sonship which is um, Christ as our mediator. Can the church say amen? We read the scripture to you last week, saints, in, um, 
think it was in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapters 2, verses 5 and 6, and dealt with Christ. Let's, let's matter of fact, let's just go read it so we can refresh our memories and then we'll move on from there. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapters 2, and we are interested in verses 5 and 6 as a place to start. Because when you deal with mediatorship, you have to deal with it from two perspectives. First, you have to deal with it with Christ, the man. Then there is Christ, the church, because the Christ of today is the New Testament church. And so we're going to try to get into that aspect of it tonight, if the Lord will. And so we're going to read here, 2 Timothy chapters, numbers um, 2, verses numbers 4 through 6. It says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now this expresses 1 uh, Timothy? 1 Timothy, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm, I thought I said 1st. Said first. I must have said 2nd too. I, as I commonly say, I am my father's son. Praise the Lord. All right. Yeah, that's what I want. Who would have? All men. Now, now this is all inclusive. All men, male men, female men, black men, white men, blue men, purple men, yellow men, all men. Salvation is for all men. There's enough salvation or enough blood shed through Jesus Christ to cover the human family. Can the church say amen? We already dealt with him as the redeemer, right? The redeemer has to do with the price that was paid for redemption, and that price uh, that was paid for redemption is what we call atone, uh, atonement. Praise the Lord. It is the appeasement of God um, or the appeasement for man's sin that was given to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And what was that for? All men. Now, this does not mean that all men would accept it. It simply means that all men, praise the Lord, Sister Tamara, has the opportunity to receive it. Can the church say amen? So when you have people that make the, makes, make the excuse that God does not want to save them, they don't understand the word of God because he would have all men to be saved. Can the church say amen and what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. What is truth? Somebody say, thy word is truth. Who's the person of truth? Jesus is the person of truth. He is the personification of what truth is. What that means is this. If you want to know what truth is, you have to look at the demonstration of truth that was seen in Jesus. He displayed all the truth that God wanted. Now, I want to give you this as I move on. As a son of God, Jesus displayed to us who are sons of God, everything we need, we need to do in the sonship to make it. Can the church say amen? So when, let me give you, let me give you this, this little tidbit of information as we move on. So everything that you need to know about how to be saved can be seen, or any question that you need answered, you can look into the example that Jesus gave to understand. Now, when Jesus was talking with his disciples, the disciples would ask him, ask Jesus a question. What they were doing, they were petitioning him. All right? Or as it were, they were praying to him, asking him, Lord, what should we do about this situation? And if we are wise and we are students of the word of God, we will look at the response that Jesus gave in the word of God to every question that was asked him. And in that response, saints, you will see what God's will is. So if we have a similar situation and or question and or need, all we have to do is go to when he was petitioned and the answer he gave. See, sometimes people are asking God about questions that he's already answered. Let me repeat that. Sometimes people are asking God's about, God about questions he's already answered. So when sometimes people come to me and say, well, pastor, what do you say? The Bible said this. What am I doing? I'm sending you back to where the petition was answered in the word of God. Can the church say amen? How many times 
did Jesus pull his disciple aside after they asked him something and impart unto them and explain to them the things that they needed to know? Do your research. Hundreds of times he did this throughout the Bible. Not only the disciples, but whoever asked him a question. Can the church say amen? The Bible is full of examples, praise the Lord, patterns, figures, types, shades, manners, customs. It's all, it's all throughout the Bible. And God answers questions over and over again. And so it is in these settings many times that our questions get answered. They get answered sometimes before we even ask them. It's in our mind. And all of a sudden we come to Bible class and God answers it. Praise the Lord. Or we're reading our, we're reading our Bible. Oh, oh, and there it is. Oh, this is how you deal with it. When someone disrespects you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Can the church say amen? The answer is there. So I wanted to give you that. So that's not a part of the lesson, but in any case, he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge that is the know-how of the truth. Because God has the perfect, he knows the perfect means to accomplish the perfect ends of all things. Verse number five, for he, for there is one God and one mediator that has to do with one that is able to stand between two opposing parties. Can the church say amen? This is what a mediator does. A mediator, saints, has to have the knowledge of both parties in order to plead the case. And in this case, Jesus stood between man and God, and pleaded the case of man before God to bring about reconciliation between us and God. And what people don't understand is that outside of Jesus Christ, every man is opposed to God. Can the church say amen? Because of our, if people, I'm going to give you another scripture. The Bible said that every man's ways is right in his what? own eyes. The scripture did not say God's eyes. But I got a scripture for that also. The Bible tells us, saints, that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So what does that mean? That means that in as much as God's mind is not my mind, his thoughts are not my thoughts, his ways are not my ways, in order for me to be reconciled to him, he had to come himself and bring mediation and reconciliation and then give me the terms of keeping myself in a place where I can be what God would have me to be and not be at odds with him. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. And so there's one mediator mm -hmm, between what? God and man. So Jesus was able to touch both parties. He was able to touch God and touch man, somebody say, at the same time. See, when God got in the body of Jesus Christ, he never ceased from being God. Praise the Lord. He stepped, Sister Tani, into the position of the sonship, but still was God. Praise the Lord. He simply took upon a different means, a different role to accomplish this scripture in our life. So he can bring us to the knowledge of the truth. The truth was here, in, was here in, uh, as it were, under the law, but they didn't know how to truly understand what it meant. So what did he do? He came as a demonstration of that truth and mediated between man and God and brought us in. Can the church say amen? That's love tonight. <laughs> That's the greatest love in the world. Praise the Lord. All right. And so he says, but God, uh, be it says between God and man, what is that? The man, Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. who gave himself a ransom for some. For all. Somebody say, well, God don't want to save me. That's foolishness. Right, somebody say, well, God don't love me. That's nonsense. We read a scripture last, a week ago. They said, what uh, about um, him giving his life, as it were, for his friends? Praise the Lord. That's nonsense. He loves everybody. He doesn't love everything everybody does. Praise God. But he loves the souls of men. Because the scripture said, all souls are mine, saith the Lord. And he wants to save every soul. Now, don't get me wrong. God does not like what ISIS and all of these individuals uh, do, are doing over here around the world, cutting people's heads off and all that. God don't love that stuff. But he does love a man's soul. 
And if they repent and are born again, they can be saved just like anybody else. Can the church say amen? So God wants every man to be saved. Getting back to my original point, it says here, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus he's talking about here, of course, was Christ. But the man Christ Jesus is no longer here. And when he left, we read the scripture, I think in St. John chapter, chapter 14, verse 3, when he left, he says that, I, that ye may be where I am. And where he was when he spoke those words, Sister Debbie was in the office of the sonship. And when he left that office, he put them in that office, put the church in that office, and now the church mediates between the world and God. That is to say that no man can come unto the church except they come through somebody say her. That's what I was preaching this Sunday. Praise the Lord. You have to come through her because in order, in order for you to be saved, you have to come through the church in order to receive salvation. Some people say, well, I can do it on my own. No man will do it on his own. Praise the Lord. Just like no man was birthed into the world on his own, no man will be birthed into the church on his own. Can the church say amen? Everybody will have to come through her. So there is the man, Christ Jesus, then there is the church, the Christ of today, the church in the earth. And we are the ones that have to help them come. When they come into the church, we have to be the ones, of course, I have to preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. And the church births them, and we take them on in the church to somebody say perfection. Can the church say amen? All right, let me give you some more scriptures. Let's move on from there. We're going to examine him as an intercede, as an intercessor, and him also as the high priest. Can the church say praise the Lord? Let me give you an example here to show you, before we go there, that God was well pleased to mediate for man in the body of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew. I'm going to get this one right. Matthew chapter 3. Praise the Lord. I'm going to take my, somebody say, take your time, Pastor. Praise the Lord. I got about 40 years to do this, if the Lord tarry. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, what verse do we want here? Chapter 3. And we're going to read from verses 15 through 17. This is him at the rivers of Jordan. And show you that God was well pleased to mediate through Jesus Christ. Let's read this verse, these verses. Read. And Jesus answered and said unto him, that is John the Baptist, suffer it to be, uh, uh, to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now this is the point. The point is in order for the righteousness of God to be fulfilled, Jesus had to demonstrate to his creation, this act. Because under the Old Testament law, the Bible makes the point that they cleansed the priest, saints, before he went into the tabernacle, before he accomplished the service of the Lord. He had to do two things. Number one, he had to cleanse himself. Number two, he had to make a sacrifice. Every time, praise the Lord, before he entered into the sanctuary, Praise the Lord. Hence, nobody can enter into the church except they follow this example. So he's fulfilling righteousness here. Did he need to be baptized? Most certainly not. Praise the Lord. But he had to give us a demonstration in order for him to fulfill the righteousness of his own word. Have you ever met somebody that they will tell you to do something that they won't do? Brother Bob, you ever have a friend like that? Both of you guys are standing on the top of the... We, when I was a kid, we used to jump off garages and stuff. He said, you jump. No, you jump first. You jump. What is he trying to do? He's trying to make you the guinea pig. Praise the Lord. He wants to, you to jump off the garage and break your leg so he can laugh at you. And then, them, then, them, then they cart you off an avalanche. Praise the Lord. Isn't this what happens? Jesus demonstrated to us what we needed to do to enter into his church before we ever got here. Can the church say amen? He was big enough to do what he needed to do to show us what we needed to do. 
So he's simply fulfilling the righteousness of his own word. Can the church say amen? Read verses number 16. He allowed it. He allowed it to be so. Because remember, John the Baptist, you read the previous verse, John the Baptist felt unworthy to baptize him. But this was John the Baptist's mission. It was John the Baptist's mission to prepare the way of the Lord. And after he did this, the scripture made the point that he said, I must decrease that he may increase. For this purpose was John the Baptist brought into the earth. And the scripture said there was none greater than John the Baptist. He is the greatest prophet that ever lived. Why? Because he had the distinct honor and responsibility to be the forerunner of Christ and to introduce him to the world. Can the church say amen? So that simply means he allowed it to be so. He said, John the Baptist, let's get this done because I got a job to do. Can the church say amen? Verses numbers um, uh, 16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Now, there was a sister. I'm going to give you this. I think I told you this in another Bible study. There was a sister. One of our bishops was teaching about this and um, was making the point that Jesus was baptized. And he said, Jesus went into the water. And the sister said, well, uh, well, 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 well you know, Bishop, I don't have a problem with, with disputing that. Well, well how, how did the Bible didn't say he was baptized? And, she, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get this straight in my mind. But he told the sister, well, he, he, the sister asked him, well, how did Jesus get in the water? How did Jesus come out the water anyway? And the, and, and, bishop, and the bishop said, well, sister, if he came straightway up out of the water, you tell me how he got in it. So you, but you get the picture here. So he couldn't come out of the water unless he was in the water. Hence, when it comes to baptism, and I'm getting off the subject a little bit, but it's in our text, when it comes to baptism, there is no baptism by sprinkling. It is obvious that he comes up out of the water. It had to be enough water for him to be covered in it. Hence, baptism is, by, is, is through immersion. It is being covered, buried. Can the church say amen? Oh, hallelujah. So there is no sprinkling. You can't put some pixie dust on somebody's head and say they're baptized. You can't spit it in their face and all this nonsense. And the water didn't break. And I know people teach this too. The water, when you were in the womb the, and the water broke, they say that was baptism. That is not baptism. Praise the Lord. That is natural birth. Hence, Jesus was not have told Nicodemus that ye must be what? Born again. If your baptism, or if that was baptism and that was good enough, he wouldn't have told him you need to be born again. So just because you, the water broke in your mother's womb, you were not baptized. Can the church say amen? amen. Well, praise the Lord. All right, let's, let's finish this straightway. All out of the water. And look at what happens. And the heavens were open unto him. And he saw. He who saw, he saw. This is John the Baptist saw. This is a physical manifestation. Because remember, I'm going to show you something in the scripture. Whenever someone is filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there will be, always be a physical manifestation. Just as this scripture makes the point that the heavens were open and a physical manifestation happened, let's read it. The Spirit, a Spirit of God, descended upon him as like a dove and lighted upon him. This is John sees this. The, this was his witness, that this was the Messiah. Praise the Lord. Physical manifestation, like a dove, Lighted upon him, praise God, read, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased to what? Whom I am well pleased to what? Dwell in. Can the church say amen? Now let's get back to this manifestation. Just as there is a manifestation that we saw in this baptism, there's also a physical manifestation that happens when a person receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know what that is? It is the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Can the church say amen? And in this text, this, we see this. Not only do we see this in um, this text, but we also have to make this point that Jesus, uh, the scripture said in verse number 17, and lo, the heavens 
um, and lo, a voice from heaven. Now, let me give you this understanding because some people have interpreted this, that the heavens opened and then all of a sudden God spoke out of heaven. The voice from heaven was the voice that was in the body of Jesus Christ. Because let me make the point. The Bible didn't say a voice in heaven, a voice from heaven. Where did Jesus come from? He came from heaven. That voice spoke out of that body. God spoke out of that body and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased to what? Be in. And that manifestation as a dove was a manifestation that he was well pleased to dwell in that body. Let me give an example. If I was to go over to Muskegon and preach, and, and I said, well, I'm coming to preach, and I'm a voice in Muskegon, but I'm from Grand Rapids. No, I'm actually a voice from Grand Rapids preaching in Muskegon. Je you understand what I'm saying? Jesus was from heaven. Praise God. So when it says the voice from heaven, it simply makes the point that he spoke out of that body and that he was well pleased to be in that body. And by what that meant was that he was well pleased to use this body to redeem and to mediate on the behalf of fallen man. It took God to do it. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. And if people get that revelation, they will understand that if it had not been for the Lord, none of us would be here right now. Can the church say praise the Lord? All right, let's go. Let me get to my original point here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at him interceding on our behalf as a mediator. Everybody understand that? If you have a question, you can hold it, and I'll answer it later. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. I don't think I gave you the scriptures last week, did I? Am I going over something I already talked about? Maybe not. I guess no, no one raised their hand. 4 in, we're going to start with verses number 14 which will be sufficient, down through 16. Praise the Lord. Are we there? Let's read here. Seeing then that we have a great, somebody say high priest. Read. That is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Now this is important. Because every time under the Old Testament saints that the high priest went into the holies of holies, he was going in, Sister Debbie, to intercede on the behalf of his brethren. The high priest was always taken out amongst his brethren. This is the reason why in order for God to be able to mediate and to feel the pains of what we feel, he had to take upon the form of, somebody say, his brethren. And that brethren, of course, is mankind. He had to take upon himself the nature of a man, fulfilling also the law inasmuch as the high priest was taken out amongst men to minister unto men concerning the things of God. Can the church say amen? The difference between the high priest of Old, Old Testament and the, and Jesus Christ was that the high priest in the Old Testament was a sinner. And he had to go in, somebody say, twice. Once for himself and once for the people. But Jesus went in, the Bible said, once for all. And accomplished, the scripture said, eternal uh, redemption for the human family. Can the church say amen? So because of that, we can hold our profession. Because we know that he feels what we feel. Praise the Lord. Never think, saints, that God doesn't understand you. Even when your brother don't understand you. Praise the Lord. Even when your sister, Pam, don't, I don't know if you have a sister, even when, when a family member don't understand. Even when the husband don't understand. The wife does not understand. We have one that does understand. Why? Let's keep reading here. For we have a, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The term infirmities has to do with weaknesses. Praise the Lord. He knows the weakness and the frailty that is in every single man. 
The Bible calls your body and my body grass. Praise the Lord. And grass is temporal. It is seasonal. I know in Florida they got grass year-round, but trust me, they cutting their grass every couple weeks. They're chopping it down. And the scriptures make the point that, um, that as it were, it is soon cut down. Jesus understands what it feels like to be in a frail body. He knows what it feels like to hurt. He knows what it feels like to hunger. He knows what it feels like to be uh, at want or in, or in need every single thing. Praise the Lord. This is our mediator we're talking about. So the term, um, what did I say here? Infirmities has to do with weaknesses. And he interceded to help us with our weakness. And how does God do that with us now? Somebody say prayer. And I'm going to give you that scripture in a minute. Prayer. Because the Holy Spirit intercedes in prayer. Praise the Lord. With groanings and utterances that cannot be interpreted as it were. And I'm paraphrasing. Praise the Lord. So when we get into prayer, it is as the Holy Spirit, Sister Amy, is interceding on our behalf and is helping our weaknesses. It's, it, it is strengthening us. Because there's some things, saints, that I don't, that I don't know what, how to pray as I ought to or what to pray for. Praise the Lord. But when we get in the Spirit and our prayers reach heaven, we've gotten our intercession. And how does God do it? He does it through prayer and the Holy Spirit that is in the child of God. That's why prayer is important. Prayer is the lifeline of the child of God. It is where we petition God and God intercedes on our behalf. Can the church say amen? Somebody say, you can't get that on Google. MySpace. They only do MySpace no more, do they? That's old, isn't it? Snapchat. I don't know. Whatever. They, you can't get that. You got to get it. You got, we have to get it through by allowing him to help our infirmities or our weaknesses. Can the church say amen? Why? But he was tempted, what? At all points. And let me deal with this all points. Think in your mind any temptation that a man can receive. And Jesus felt that. Can the church say amen? Oh, yes, he did. Every single thing that any man could ever receive, the Lord felt it. Praise the Lord. Let's keep reading here. What? Yet without sin. So now this is how he did it. Because he was a faithful high priest, he offered himself without spot to God. He went through the process of being tempted. And in one writer, one writer said he can secure them that are tempted, as the scripture said in the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. So what God said is now that he has come as a faithful high priest, he felt what we felt, and he's overcome. Amen. Now he's saying that we can overcome and do what scripture number uh, 16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, praise the Lord, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So when we come boldly to the throne of grace, how do we do that? Getting back to my, my, uh, my other point, through prayer. We're coming to the high priest that feels, this is the point I want to get to, that feels what you feel, that knows what each and every one of us go through. We're not coming to somebody that has no idea as to what I feel, I've talked to my wife, and my wife may not relate to me. She may want to say, get tough, brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Deal with it. But I can come to Jesus, and Jesus say, I understand what you're going through. And I'm going to help you through, somebody say, the process. So people need to stop belly aching and stop seeing that God knows what we feel like. And he's there to help us. Because somebody say, he went through it. And he made it. Let me give you another scripture. This is not on our subject. Let me give you this also. In the book of Hebrews, to show you that he feels everything we go through. Let me see here. We want Hebrews 12 and 4. Only verse we're going to read to make the point here. That Jesus knows what we're going through. And everybody cannot say that they did this, but Jesus did. Hebrews 12 and 4. Let's read this. What did it say? Ye have not yet resisted under blood, 
striving against sin. Now, this is speaking about Jesus. What did Jesus do? He resisted unto blood, striving against sin. They beat him, praise the Lord. They plucked out his beard by the roots. Hallelujah. And how did he, why did he do it? He did it, as it were, striving against sin. He did it to free you and I from the pains of sin and death. That's going to be one of also the works of the sonship. He's going to bru- he bruised the serpent head and destroyed the works of the devil. Praise the Lord. When Jesus came here, praise God, and was triumphant in death, he bruised the kingdom of the devil. Why? Because he brought life to us through what he did. And he's eventually going to destroy his works altogether. And you know what that work is? Somebody say sin. Because the Bible says the devil sinned it from the beginning. He is, a, he is no good. I don't know why people listen to him. He is up to no good. Can the church say amen? Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. All right, let's keep moving on here. Let's go to the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews. Let's keep making this point here. All right, seven, and we want verses numbers. Um, 25 is, I think, what I want. Is that it? I think it is. Yes, dealing with intercession. Yes, this is what we want. We want this particular verse here. Can the church say amen? I don't know if we read this, but you can put this in your notes to make the point that the mediator interceded between two opposing parties. Read here, wherefore he is able also to save them to what? The uttermost that come uh, unto God by him. He is able to save them, that is us, that come unto God by them. First it was to the Jews. They, re- they rejected it. Judah died in unbelief. Now come unto them or us. It's come unto us. Can the church say amen? Who come to him or through the sonship. Because no man, Sister Hayes, cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. Praise the Lord. Another place he said, I am my Father, I one. So you got to recognize what God did in the sonship to get into the sonship of Christ. Can the church say amen? There's no other way to do it. Praise the Lord. He is able to save, um, let's finish reading this verse, seeing he uh, liveth, he, uh, excuse me, ever liveth to make what? Intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. And this is what a high priest did. His whole job was to make intercession. He was taken out amongst his brethren to feel what they feel so that when they come to him, he knows how to help them. Praise the Lord. I'm going to show you how God also does with the pastorship. He takes the pastor from amongst the people so that the people, so so that the pastor would understand the needs of the people. Can the church say amen? And many times God would take the pastor from right amongst the people that he served with. So he would know how to help the people that he is with. Now we do it backwards nowadays. Now, I'm not saying the other way don't work. I'm just giving you a more perfect scenario because the pastor should know those that he helps. There's no greater relationship than in the church than a relationship between the saved child of God and their pastor. There's no greater relationship. Praise the Lord. Let me give you an example so you can understand it. The pastor, in most cases, is there at every integral part of a person's life. He's there at birth. Isn't that right? He's also there at death. Praise the Lord. And all in between. Marriage, all together. And I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm simply making the point that this is the way it is. So Jesus, as a high priest, was taken out amongst his brother, and he ever make his intercession for them or you and I. Can the church say amen? He's ever interceding on our behalf. He is, as we're going to talk about tonight, if we get to it, he is a days man. Can the church say amen? He is one that goes in betwixt us and God. That's what he did. Can the church say amen? When I couldn't plead my case, he pleaded it for me. You know why? Because he was spotless. 
This is the reason why, let me give you this example as I move on, this came to my mind. When a, when a judge is on, the, is on the bench, he is held to a higher standard than those that come into his courtroom. They will kick a judge off the bench if they find out that he is in certain indiscretions and certain things in his life. Even if they're moral things, they don't even have to be criminal. Did you guys know that? Why? Because he has to be impartial to those that he judge. Can the church say amen? Let me tell you about Jesus, though. Jesus was spotless and made himself subject to the creature so that when we came into the courtroom and the Bible said all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what that judgment seat is at? You sitting in it. It's the church. So that when we came before the judgment seat of Christ, we would have the wherewithal to judge properly so that we wouldn't be judged. Can the church say amen? You see how God does it? When I couldn't do it, Brother Bert, he, he, he judged my case. Praise the Lord. And then gave me opportunity to say, look, I, I made an opportunity for you to accept the plea. All you got to do is accept the plea and you ain't guilty. It's over. Can the church say amen? Accept the fact that you need me. In case closed, the book is closed. Accept what I've done. Wow. Repent. Be born again of water and of spirit, and it's over. You're in. You're justified by me. He appeased, saints, the wrath of God as a high priest. Inasmuch as he was the high priest, he was also the lamb, saints. He slew himself and presented the blood unto God and turned around and received it unto himself. We're going to get into that tonight also. I got to stop talking, though. Somebody say stop talking. All right, we read that scripture. Let's go to Hebrews. We're in Hebrews, aren't we? Hebrews, back to Hebrews 5. Now we want verses numbers 1 and 2. Can the church say amen? We're talking about our what? We're talking about our high priest, our mediator. We're talking about him as the mediator and the high priest. Read here verses numbers 1. For every high priest taken from... A what? Among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God. The ordained for men and things pertaining to God. That's the scripture we just quoted. Read. He, uh, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for what? Sin. This is from a natural perspective. But instead of Jesus offering sacrifices upon sacrifices, he offered himself. And he covered all of those Old Testament sacrifices, which were types of Christ, once for the sins of all mankind. Read verses number two. Who can have what? Compassion on the ignorant. Because remember, there were those under the Old Testament, there were many of them that sinned through ignorance, through their lack of knowledge. He can have compassion. And to further make the point is that when Jesus came unto Jerusalem, he looked upon the city of Jerusalem, Sister Pam, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that murders the prophets. He also said that they were as sheep with no shepherd. So what did he do? He came as a shepherd, and the high priest was a type of a shepherd or a pastor, if you guys didn't know that. He came to give them what they didn't have. Praise the Lord. And that's exactly what he did for me. When I didn't know what to do, I thought I was so, I, I, made the, I gave the testimony, I thought I was so smart. Couldn't nobody tell me what to do. I thought I knew everything. Praise the Lord. And two, I got out here in the world and found out I didn't know nothing. Praise the Lord. I thought I didn't know nothing. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I know I'm using Ebonics, but I didn't know anything. I should say that. Let me be educated. Somebody say, be educated. I didn't know anything. Praise the Lord. Read verses. Uh, let's finish reading this. And on them that what? Are out of the way. Those that are sin through ignorance and them that also are out of the way. Because both of them are. Read. For that he himself also 
is can pass with infirmity. That, that would be, of course, the natural high priest. He is can pass with, with infirmities, and he knows what it, what it means to have weakness. Jesus subjected himself to weakness in as much as he subjected himself to vanity. The only difference was that he, God was in him, and he could not sin because he did not have the nature of a man in him. God was his father. God fathered the body or sired it. Praise God. He called, he called, he allowed, as it were, procreation to take place. It was conceived in her womb, and then he got in the womb of Mary. Praise God. As that fetus matured and formed the spirit of life in her womb or became the person of that body and became God that was born into the world and was God in the womb and never left being God after he got into the world. Somebody say hallelujah. Can the church say amen? And that is the love of God for you and I. Can the church say praise the Lord? Let me show you how he did it. Let's go to uh, the prophecy of the in uh, let's, Zechariah 6. And we want verses numbers 12. Let's look at the prophecy. This is a prophecy of how he was going to bring the Gentiles in through Jesus Christ and make peace between two opposing parties. That is God and man. Zechariah 6, verses numbers 12 through 13, and then verses 15. When you have it, you can say amen. Somebody say, this is love tonight. This is love. All right? And speak unto him, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, behold, the man whose name is the branch, this is another title of Jesus Christ. He is the branch. Another place, he is the root and the offspring of David. As the root, David came out of him. As the offspring, he came out of David. Can the church say amen? You, get the, you, you understand what that means? For one point, David, as the natural seed, of course, the children of Israel, came up out of Jesus Christ. Read, right? And as the offspring... Um, or as the root, they came out of him. Praise the Lord. But here is dealing with him as somebody say the branch. This is simply another title of Jesus Christ. Read. And he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. Uh, the temple of the Lord. So this simply makes the point that he's going to build the temple. The temple of the Lord is the church. But the Bible said the temple of God ye are. Let me give you that scripture also. Let me, let's go back. I hate to run you around like this, but I've got to make the point so you can understand. All right, let's go to um, uh, Ephesians. I think it is chapters 2 is what I want. Let me give you this scripture in the New Testament to make the point that we are a holy inhabitation of God through the Spirit. This temple that he's speaking of is what the branch was going to do when he came as the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and mediate on our behalf. Let me see. I think it is in Ephesians 2, and if memory serves me correct, I want to say around verses numbers 21 and 22. In whom also the building fitly framed together groweth up unto a holy temple unto the Lord. Now this is speaking of the church. The church is fitly framed together, which means the church is joined together in perfect harmony. Everything within the church is in its rightful place. So what that means is simply this. Everything that we do in the church as children of God ought to be within harmony with the scriptures. Our liturgy, which means our form of worship. The way we live should be in harmony with the word of God because in his house, Everything is fitly framed together. Can the church say amen? Read here verses numbers 22. In whom, what? Ye are also, ye are built um, together for, a, for a, a habitation of God through the Spirit. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through what? The Spirit. This is the church. And this is what Jesus was going to come and build, and that was the prophecy that we just read. We didn't finish reading it, so we'll go back there, go back to Ezekiel, I mean, uh, Zechariah, chapters numbers um, 12, excuse me, 6, and verses numbers uh, 
11, uh, 13 now. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. This is Jesus. So when he came, what came to earth? The temple of the Lord came to earth. The tabernacle came to earth. Praise the Lord. Then he left here and put us in that temple and called it the house of God, called it mansions, called it palaces. Praise the Lord. Called it um, the bride. Praise the Lord. These are all titles of what we are. Can the church say amen? And I don't know why people think that it's any, there's anything better. There's nothing better than what we have. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be in the house. Because being in Jesus is better than being anywhere else. Because all my needs get met in be, being in him, deacon. For the Bible said he sh shall supply all your needs through his riches and glory. But you got to be in the house. Can the church say praise the Lord? If you're going to get every need met, because God ain't meeting everybody's need. Some people are meeting their own needs by their own means. But God will meet his people's needs as we get into somebody say his house. So who's going to build the house? The branch. Jesus is going to build the house. Or the temple, excuse me. All right? Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. Who, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. God in Christ gets the glory. Can the church say amen? Remember I made the point that God gets the glory, but God will give honor to men that build or that uh, do that which God has required for them to do. This is the reason why we give honor to whom honor is due, but we never give the glory to man. We respect, we honor those that have went before us, but we always give the glory to God. Amen. Can the church say amen? All right, bear the glory, and he amen. shall sit um, and rule upon his throne. What is his throne? Somebody say your heart. Praise the Lord. The throne is the heart. Can the church say amen? Where's God's domain at now? The term kingdom is a two-part word. King and domain. The king's domain is in the heart of his people. Can the church say amen? He sets in our heart. The late bishop, I think, um, I think it was the late bishop Morrissey Golder, said, a man cannot sit on the throne of his own heart and has, have God as his king. And that's a powerful statement. A man cannot sit on the own throne, on the, on the own throne of his, his heart and have God rule. Somebody got to get kicked off. You ever played that little game, King of the Mountain? Now, where I, I didn't have a mountain when I lived there. We had rocks where I lived at. So we had to stand on top of a rock and try not to get kicked off. God, had, God is supposed to stand on the pinnacle of our hearts. Can the church say amen? This is in the church. No. The mind, right, right. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what the scripture said. Right. Right, You're, because the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it comes to influence our mind or our spirit, our spirit man. This here. And when this is influenced in every other part of our life, uh, gets in line. God is not talking about, the, of course, the organ that pumps blood. He's talking about the mind. Let this mind be in you, which, is, which was also in Christ Jesus, to be like-minded. So certainly the heart, the throne, the heart, I mean, the throne has to do um, where he ruled from. He rules in our heart or in our mind and controls our life. Can the church say amen? And he shall be a what? Priest upon his throne. So here's the point. Priest upon his throne. The priest didn't sit on the throne, but he is the priest, and he is also the king. Can the church say amen? For he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Can the church say amen? Read here. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Hence, the only way for him to get the job done, he had to come as a high priest. Because he already was the king of kings. He had to come as a high priest. And he had to sacrifice the blood of himself. Praise God. And what did he do that? He did that in earth. Then he took that blood that he sacrificed here on earth, went up into the heavens, praise God, on the first day of the week, presented that blood before God in the heavens and turned around and received it back to himself and became the God 
that received the blood of the lamb at the hands of the high priest and accomplished this scripture where the Bible said, and the counsel of peace shall be between them both in his position as priest, in his position as king, and he did it through mediating. That's the point I wanted to get to. He mediated, praise the Lord, in Jesus Christ. In verse number 15, let's read, and they that are afar off, shall come, what, and build in the temple. They that are far off is who? The Gentiles. We were far off, saints, and now we have, been, we have been allowed to come, saints, and build in the temple. And he's building our lives stone by stone. He's building in his church us stone by stone, brick by brick, because the Bible said we are lively stones. Somebody say in the building. Can the church say, what's the building? The church. Not this, not this edifice that we live in, that we come to worship in. This is where the church houses. Praise the Lord. And thank God we have a wonderful church. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to have it. I love this church and every, and every saint that's in it. Can the church say amen? And so this is the point I'm trying to get to. He did all this through him mediating on our behalf. Because I was opposed to God and needed him to help me. Can the church say amen? amen? And let me give you this scripture, and this is the last one. We, we, this probably will be the last one. Let's go to Isaiah. Praise the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. I'll give you this scripture. And if I feel good, I may be merciful and let you out literally. Praise the Lord. I know how it is. I know how it is. You, you're seeing three people right now up here. It's like an amoeba. He's, I'm splitting in twos and threes. Praise the Lord. A hard day at work, I understand. Thank God for your faithfulness. All right, this is in, in Isaiah chapter 53. You're seeing a pictorial view of the life, ministry, and death of Jesus Christ to a certain extent here. You're seeing this. This is probably one of the most uh, complete prophecies of what Jesus Christ came to do or what God, excuse me, came to do in Jesus Christ. But we want, we're interested in verses numbers um, 9, I mean, excuse me, 10 and 11 is sufficient. That's what we want. Read here. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Let's stop right there. It pleased God the Father to bruise him, Sister Hainer, God in the office of the sonship. When God looked at Jesus... He did not see him on the cross as his son. He seen him on the cross as a sinner dying for the sins of the world. This is the reason why he could suffer that death. The greatest thing, I made this point, the greatest thing that God ever did was making Jesus something he wasn't. The Bible said, he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took, praise God, the punishment for us. So I don't know why people keep wanting to live in sin when he took the punishment. Praise the Lord. So it pleased God. Don't you think for one minute it didn't because the scripture says so. It pleased God to bruise him. Praise God. Read. He has put him to grief. If you, when thou shall make his soul an offering for sin. Or God made his soul an offering for sin. His person an offering for sin through the mediatorship of God in Christ. Can the church say amen? He offered up himself. Read. He shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Read. He shall see the travail of his soul. Read. And he shall, set it, uh, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. And I made this point in a previous Bible study or preaching that through the knowledge that God gave or, or God in Christ had, the perfect knowledge of everything that needed to be done in the office of the sonship to attain e eternal redemption, he was able to be offered by his knowledge. He had the perfect knowledge of sin, hell, death, reconciliation, life, peace, intercession, everything that pertained to us coming to know him. 
He had the knowledge of it. He knew all about it. And the sacrifices in the Old Testament were dumb sacrifices. They had no knowledge why they were being sacrificed. Praise the Lord. Jesus knew why he was being sacrificed. What did he say in the Garden of Gethsemane? He says, if it uh, be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but what? Thine be done. Don't you think for one minute Jesus didn't know what was going on. That knowledge was given to him in the sonship. He knew exactly why he was going to the cross. Praise the Lord. And that in and of itself, saints, proves to us the true love of God. Because if you know what you're going to get before you get it, let me give you an example like this. All right, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. When my children do something, and then they come to me, they come shaking. Why? Because they know what time it is. Praise the Lord. They know what they're going to get depending on what they did. Can the church say amen? Do you catch, you catch the point? As Bishop used to say, you get the picture? This is the point. The point is that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing because his whole purpose was, Sister Curry, he says, I always do the will of my Father. I always do the things that please him. So that sacrifice had the perfect knowledge of everything that needed to be done to accomplish eternal redemption for the human family. And he came for that purpose to mediate, to pull two parties that were opposite ends of the spectrum together and come to one common Agreement, that is that we need somebody say him. Can the church say amen? I said I was going to be last scripture, didn't I? Praise the Lord. All right. I'm going to be good tonight. Amen. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes.